keep trying because when you find the right one, it's like magic. It's Christy with the Chirp YouTube channel. We are continuing today with another video in our little series on the autism spectrum disorder, the core deficits in an autism spectrum disorder, and how we can begin to work on all of those deficits a little bit at a time. Once again, I want to say, please get the appropriate professionals involved in your child's life if you suspect that there's any sort of a delay. I have left resources for you down below so that you can find an appropriate professional. And I want to say at this point that I have been going to physical therapy for my ankle injury for a year and a half, on and off. And for the first year plus, we saw some improvement, but then I kind of plateaued. And just recently, I guess it was about three or four months ago now, I saw a new surgeon to try to figure out how come I was still having so many problems. And he referred me to a new physical therapist. And this has blown my mind because all of a sudden, I am having a lot of improvement in a shorter period of time. I tell you this to say that sometimes it's not a good fit between the issue and the therapist. And it's the same deal for speech pathologists. Sometimes the type of therapy that the speech pathologist does isn't going to work as well for a particular child as a different kind of treatment. I believe very strongly in a play-based, child-directed type of therapy. And have found that it works absolutely the best for those kids who have difficulty engaging. If that's the kind of kid you have and you have a kind of therapist who likes to be very structured, who likes to direct everything herself or himself, that's not going to work as well for that particular kind of kid. So please keep searching look for a new therapist, keep trying, because when you find the right one, it's like magic. Moving on to our issue today, today I would like to talk about the difficulties with social interactions. Of course, we've kind of talked about these in all of the different videos that I've done so far, but in this case, I'd like to talk about particularly the difficulties with social approach, and with friend type of behaviors. So making friends and communicating in a back and forth sort of way. In upcoming videos, we will talk more about the sharing of emotions part, and we will talk more about sharing interests and things that keep a friendship going. But today I just wanna talk about sort of the initiation of relationships and the social things that happen when we see someone that we want to talk to or someone that we have something in common with. The first thing that I want to say is that when children are very young, we need to do most of this through modeling. We can't do direct teaching because it's not going to sink in because our kid isn't at that level yet where teaching, discrete teaching is going to actually make that much of a difference. First of all, we want to model in person. When the child enters the classroom, we want to model what we say to a teacher and to our friends when we enter the classroom. So we might not let the child just run into the corner and start spinning around in a circle. We might want to stop him at the door, help him wave his hand at the teacher and say, hi, Miss Christie." The kid doesn't have to say it himself. It's you saying it from his perspective. And then we maybe move on to, we turn towards friends and we say, Hi friends! And then we move on into the classroom and do whatever it is that we want to do. It's not important to me that the child says those words. It's important to me that the child is learning what the social norms are so that when he's ready, he knows what to do. We also want to use books and other resources to help reinforce 
these social norms and to help train children in what they need to do. At this point, I want to take a moment because I can hear you asking me through the internet, Christy, why do I have to teach these things to my child with an autism spectrum disorder? And I didn't have to teach any of these things to my kids who don't have an autism spectrum disorder. Well, that's a great question. We don't actually know yet, but it appears that kids with autism are training their focus on things that aren't the social interactions between people. It appears that they're focusing in the wrong places so they don't catch on to how human beings interact with each other typically. Therefore, they don't do those things. There's also a whole other level where the kind of interactions that typical, neurotypical people do aren't as meaningful to people with autism. So when I look at you in your eyes, you feel like I'm more trustworthy. When I smile, you think, oh, what a pleasant person. But when a person with autism looks in my eyes, she feels threatened. That doesn't feel like comfort to her, that feels like a threat. So the interactions that happen between people don't mean the same thing. And they aren't interpreted the same way. That's just a little aside. Moving on, talking about books, I have some great recommendations for you here. One of them is this one, the Social Skills Picture Book. One thing I like so much about this, you can look up stories by topic. I have one flagged here. Oh, look at that. Starting and maintaining a conversation about the present. So it gives you an example. It says, you can start a conversation in many ways. One way is to talk about something that is happening right now. And then it gives examples with actual kids that have little bubbles. So obviously you need to be a little bit older in order to be able to read these things. It's not gonna be a kid who's very self-focused and who's doing a lot of sensory behaviors and who's totally unengaged. You need to have a kid who's at least engaged enough to be able to read a book with you and understand what she is seeing. This book is great. I recommend it. Look for anything that is done by Dr. Carol Gray. She is the inventor of a thing called social stories, which if you've been in the world of autism for any small amount of time, you will definitely have heard of social stories and you will have heard of Dr. Carol Gray. I very much admire her work. I'll put a link to her stuff down below. She has also moved into doing videos where she films kids having social interactions and that is a great thing to watch with your kids also. You can make your own videos about what maybe a sibling acts the part that you want your other kid to do also. You can have you and a friend do a social interaction and film it on your phone and then show it to your child to practice over and over. There's something about the repetition of being able to watch those videos over and over that helps our kids learn things that they wouldn't necessarily learn in context, or at least in context that only happens one time. Also, I have these amazing little stories. These are called Matt and Molly stories. And they're just super cute. This one is social skills at home, but let's pick social skills with friends. I have, I have everything that this team put together because I liked it so much. It comes with, okay, let me see what I can get out here. Okay, so here's an example. There are no words, but there are words, uh, where are they? There are words that are, that look like this and then I typically don't use them because I talk through this with the kids so we'd say what's happening Molly friend friend is listening to music and I initially I might describe what's happening in the picture and then hopefully later on the kid would be able to describe it I believe in this case Molly is trying to say hello and she's not doing a good job. Molly pulls her friend's hair. Ouch! Stop! Molly takes her friend's headphones. Hey! 
Oh, it's not that she was trying to say hi. She wanted the headphones. Molly gets her own headphones. Everyone's happy. So you can see these are very simple and yet it introduces the idea that I can't take stuff that isn't mine. If she had it first, it belongs to her. So we are, we are introducing a topic. You can see from their, their website which stories are involved in which set, but they're adorable. They're easily draw, drawable. So even the child could easily draw these stories. So kind of as we went on discussing a story that was particularly pertinent to one of my kids, then first of all, we would talk through the story. I would talk it through, and then I would have the kid describe to me what's happening. And then we would start talking about, why is this a bad idea? Why is this a bad idea? And we, I would get the words, and I would have the kids match up the words to the appropriate picture. So we're working on telling a little narrative. We could even act this out. And I also could then not use the pictures, but just use the words and have the kid redraw the picture. They're very useful sets and super adorable. I kind of want to frame a bunch of these and just have a gallery wall of all sorts of Matt and Molly stories because I think they're so cute. <sighs> okay, so that's another option. You can use Matt and Molly stories. That is all in the modeling subheader of this video. The next subheader is direct teaching. And I told you at the beginning of the video that we cannot start simply start with direct teaching for most of our kids because they're not at the level where direct teaching is going to sink in because they're not there yet. We have to do things when the child is ready, not when we're ready, unfortunately. Some of the Matt and Molly stuff is modeling because it's more like a book. Some of it is more direct teaching. So when I move into why isn't this okay? What should Molly do? It's not okay to take someone's headphones. That's more direct teaching. We can use Matt and Molly stories for that. We can use some of these modeling stories for that also. And another way we can do it is just by watching where our child struggles and then talking about it. Maybe you notice your child walks into school and doesn't say hi to anyone. You can bring it up. So Dylan, I saw you walked into school and you didn't say hi to anybody. I think that might make your friends feel sad. And you can have a back and forth discussion about why friends might feel sad when you do that. We can have a discussion. Hey Jackson, you just hit someone. Why did you hit someone? And we can start conversations on those behaviors that aren't socially acceptable. We can start discussing why they're not socially acceptable and start practicing the alternatives. We want to put alternative options into the child's brain and then help them use those options instead whenever possible. You want to remember when you're doing direct teaching that you need to use simple language, especially if it's an issue the child doesn't understand very well, and especially considering that communication skills are always affected when you have an autism spectrum disorder, especially social communication, which will be happening if you're talking to your kid. Two people communicating is a social interaction, so it's going to be harder for kids with autism. Make sure to use simple words, use pictures or diagrams whenever possible. Always, when possible, I guess, have the kid tell you his opinion about how that interaction went down. I read one time of a child with autism who told his therapist, I have lots and lots of friends. And when the therapist dug into that a little bit more, it turned out that the child thought that everyone in the hallway was his friend because he would say hi and they would say hi and that's what friends are. Sometimes we don't use the same words for things even though we think we mean the same thing. So it's important to get your child's input on what he or she is thinking because it might not be the same thing as what you're thinking. So you might say, Jackson, why did you hit her? And he says, she was mean to me. 
and she hates me, and I needed to protect myself. And then you find out that the reason he felt she was mean to him is because she didn't say hi, or because she sat in the chair that he wanted, and he had to fight to get it back, or some, something like that. It's not always a logical reason. In fact, for a neurotypical person, a lot of times it won't be a logical reason. And we need to dig to get to the bottom of how we can offer alternates that are going to work for the issue that the child believes he has, not just for the thing that I see. There's a lot to unpack with social communication and with those social interactions that kind of fall apart a little bit sometimes in the autism spectrum experience. Keep in mind, it's a bad idea to try to deal with all of them at once. Pick one, address it the best way you can through good modeling, whether that is books about the topic or your own personal in-person modeling. And then when possible, teach directly to that issue. Just do a little lesson. Here's how we say hi to teachers. Here's how we say hi to friends. Also keep in mind, please don't teach your children to be little gentlemen when everyone else is saying, yo dog. Teach your kid to say, yo dog, instead of, hello, how are you today? Not to teachers. We need to teach the appropriate thing for the appropriate circumstance. And for our kids, that can be difficult to interpret. It's an ongoing process. Keep it up. You're doing the right thing by helping your kid learn these skills because he or she is going to fit into the world better and the world's going to understand him or her better if we can just keep communicating. I hope you got some good ideas out of this video. Look down below for all of the links to these fabulous things and I'll see you in my next video. Bye!